the, uh, the serum concentration is 10 to 20 micrograms per mil, milligrams per deciliter. Um, but you can see side effects right at the top end of the therapeutic range, and then as soon as you get above 20, they tend to start having lots of side effects. And the side effects can be lethal. So you've got cardiovascular and neurologic uh, that are in, uh, well, arrhythmias, CNS, toxicity, those are two of the big ones. Um, so for that reason, <coughs> if it requires monitoring, you have to monitor serum levels when you use the alkaline. And it affects everything. It affects the, uh, it has lots of drug interactions. Uh, and smoking and theophylline are, um, in terms of combination, you have to use a lot of theophylline in smokers because they can chew it up extremely quickly. So, what I want you to know is that it's another bronchodilator in COPD. It's like one of your third line. In asthma, you will see it also. It'll never be a preferred. It'll never be a second line, but it may be other bronchodilator. It will be in that category. So it's, and the other thing is it's cheap, 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 dirt cheap. Um, so compared to everything else that you can use, this is like no, no, very little cost. So it's something to consider, uh, but it has lots of um, pharmacokinetic challenges. You'd really need a pharmacist working with you or working with somebody who's very um, skilled uh, and knowledgeable about its, um, it's pharmacokinetics. The other thing with kids, it's one of those that kids, when between about uh, two and nine, they can chew up that drug so fast you can hardly get enough in them. And then they hit about nine and their liver starts getting better uh, at metabolizing it. It goes down, their dose keeps going down. Um, so they are, they're a real challenge even in the pediatric because between infants, uh, uh, children and then the older children, there's a lot of genetic differences. So that's the kinds of, that's the things you should take away. A bronchodilator, usually third line, uh, at least, not, not much higher. Many drug interactions. Uh, adverse effects, if you can think caffeine, then you can think of the side effects of, um, of uh, theophylline because they are both methylxanthines. So most of the jitteriness, the, if you drink way too much coffee, like me this morning, you get heightened awareness, hypervigilant, uh, they are very uh, nervous, uh, shaky. Uh, so high caffeine intake, theophylline toxicity uh, are common, would, would overlap. Um, let's see. Uh, they're a, a pharmacokinetically complicated, uh, narrow therapeutic index. Those are the things you need to take away. The rest of this on the other page are just kind of things for your uh, additional information. I'm not going to test you over those. But the things I just went over are fair, fair game. Big concepts of the offering. Inhaled corticosteroids. Questions about the alkaline? Okay, inhaled corticosteroids, mainstay of asthma. If you have anybody who is more than uh, intermittent asthma, you have got to have them on a steroid. At least for now, based on what we know, inflammation is the main problem. You have got to control the inflammation to control the symptoms. For the majority of patients, this will be true. What about COPD? Is it also the mainstay? No, it's not. Uh, in, in COPD, we only add it as for like stage three. So it'd be people who are having frequent exacerbations. Look at your handout, COPD handout. Look over on the page.
Exacerbations is when people die, so you want to keep them out of exacerbations, both for asthma and uh, COPD. A kid that has been hospitalized for asthma has got an increased risk of mortality from asthma for 18 months. If they have had ICU admittance with being ventilated, it's extremely high. Those kids are the highest risk for dying in the next few months of, of asthma. So. Pay attention to exacerbations. It ought to be one of the things you're asking about when they come in to see you. Have you been hospitalized since I last saw you? Have you been to the ER since I last saw you? Have you had extra treatments? Did you go into your doctor for more treatments? Have you had a steroid burst? That would tell you something about uh, an exacerbation. Those would all be key words to use in an exacerbation. Okay. So steroids, mechanism of action, they're anti-inflammatory, they're pretty powerful. Uh, they don't hit everything. So some people who, and uh, that subset, 20% subset, that doesn't respond to what you are doing, it's usually going to be, a, be I've, done the, I've done the steroids, we do burst, but they're never quite responding like you expect. Uh, but most, 80% of your patients are going to do really well on an inhaled corticosteroid. That's their controller medicine. They can use it with or without a long-acting bronchodilator. They will always have a rescue. An asthma patient should always have a rescue. Always. If they are more than intermittent, they have to have a controller. And that controller has to be a steroid, can have an, a long-acting a bronchodilator added on, but it would never be used as the controller by itself. Okay, things I've already said. So how does how do the steroids work? Well, just as a reminder, there at the top, uh, these are one of the few uh, mechanisms they work on a nuclear receptors, so they they can get into a cell pretty easily. And then in the cell, they have, there are receptors in all of our cells that will hook up with a glucocorticoid. And that complex will, will form and protect it until it can get it into your nucleus and where it can act on the DNA. It does two things. It will suppress inflammation by decreasing the amount of inflammatory uh, proteins that are made. But it may also put out things that will, um, so it can increase, it'll decrease inflammatory proteins, increase those that are anti-inflammatory. So it does two different things. Both promote a reduction in inflammation. So you'll see there on the side, inflammatory cells, it decreases the number of eosinophils in most patients. Decrease the cytokines that are inflammatory. What would be some cytokines? Give me examples. Interleukins. Okay, those are one of the big ones. Uh, decreases macrophage numbers. Cytokines, dendritic cells. Okay, so when you have an asthma attack, first of all, the initial, the acute, is that bronchoconstriction. Okay. That's the early phase. What's the late phase due to? How long is late? When does late occur? We've talked about this before. In allergic reaction, when's the late phase? 12 hours, about 12 hours. Okay. So if you treat just the acute, they will often relapse 12 hours later. Okay. So early phase is due to local effects, histamine release, mast cells that are, most mast cells are in eosinophils are in the tissue. They degranulate, they release their histamines. But they also release chemotactic agents. And what is that? They recruit. They're calling out, come on, here it is. So it takes those cells, the, the bone marrow starts ramping up, putting out more macrophages, putting out more eosinophils, and they're migrating. 
all the time until they get to that point, and then they set up a big inflammatory response. That's the late phase. Okay. So these drugs will, corticosteroids always work on the late phase. They're never good in the, on the acute phase. Now, we might give them in the acute phase because we know how long it takes for them to work. <clears throat> All right, so in indication, persistent asthma, everybody with persistent asthma ought to have an inhaled corticosteroid on board. How much they have, it depends a lot on severity and the, and the stage. So they can be on high, medium, or low. One of the key, what we, I've talked about this before, so let your brain hear it again. This is one of those drugs where we start high and go low. Almost all the other times we're going to go, we're going to start low, titrate up, start high, back off. Until we find that level, we always want to use the lowest amount of corticosteroid that will control them. Most of the time it's going to stay in the airway, but it's always some of it's going to get out, will be absorbed because they're going to swallow it, swallow part of the dose. It is their controller. It's their number one controller in asthma. In COPD, it's third, third line at best. It just doesn't do anything. Inflammation's not the biggest part. It's damage to those air, it's damage to the alveoli and the bronchioles that is uh, the big problem in COPD. You destroy. So you decrease the ability to uh, do gas exchange. You've lost, uh, you, you're born with a million alveoli. And COPD just keeps destroying it, destroying it, destroying it. So you lose surface area to exchange gas. That's the problem. It's not inflammation. It's loss of, of tissue that you can never regenerate. Okay. Contraindications. I put down there the milk proteins, the lactose in the Advair. Next page. So adverse effects, two things with topical or with the inhaled steroids. One is dysphonia. What does that mean? <laughs> so difficult sound is a, probably a better word. So it, what it does, one of the long-term effects of, of uh, steroids anywhere in the body is that they call muscle weakening. And so it thins out those muscles right around the larynx. And so their voice changes, their tone changes. Um, I've had, a, here, a, here's a patient story. She, a lady came in and I'd uh, seen her for a long time and, and I wasn't doing her asthma, I was doing her diabetes, but she also had asthma. And so we were talking about, I knew she sang in the choir, she goes, no, I don't sing anymore. I said, why not? She, goes, so, she said, well, my voice changed. She said, I got older, my voice changed. So what it was is that steroid, uh, and so it makes their voice lower, changes the tenor of the, of the voice, uh, makes it more husky. Women will tend to notice it more uh, than uh, kids, or than uh, maybe men, but um, it will come back. The muscles can recover, but the best thing is use a spacer device. Rinse and spit. Rinse their mouth out, spit it out, use a spacer. <coughs> It'll keep all that uh, condensation from their, in their mouth. Topical candidiasis, another big reason to use a spacer, also rinse and spit. So use a spacer and then once you've done it, you breathe it in, you rinse your mouth, spit it out. Expected effects with, um, in asthma. So let's talk about what we would expect. How would we know that our therapy was working? How would we know that our steroid and our rescue medicine together, what things would we ask them about? Okay, well, number one, you want to know how many, how often they're using their albuterol. Okay, and what do, what would we consider good control with that? Zero to less than two times a week, right? What else would we ask them about? <coughs> shout it out because my ears are old and I cannot hear you. So night, shout it. night, night time, yes. Okay, 
Wakening at night is a sign that their airways are not well controlled. Okay? So you want to ask them, in the last month, has a kid been waking up? You've been waking up? Have you had to get up in the middle of the night and use your inhaler? With adults, I do that. With, uh, with parents, I'm more asking, okay, tell me how often they're getting up and not able to go back to sleep or disturb sleep or you got up and gave them a treatment. So nighttime, if you look on your chart, in your quick reference, it will show you under well-controlled, controlled, Look on page nine. <clears throat> One of the first symptoms they list is nighttime awakening. Page nine. And it, it goes to uh, age, so less than two times a week. Uh, oh, six, sorry. I was looking at it upside down. Right here at top. This should not be, I mean, they should, this, I'm sure he talked about. Nighttime awakenings. If they go in the last, I usually start at the last week. I go with shorter periods of time that I keep moving it out. The past week, if they, if you wake, awakened and had to use your inhaler. Nope. Well, what about the last month? I tried to nail it down because that's going to help. So look down this list. These are the things you're going to ask them about. So what's next? Interference and activities? Yeah. One of the number one causes of missed work, missed uh, school is asthma. So I ask them, how often do they miss school in the last, since I last saw you? How often have you missed work because of asthma in the last month or three months, whatever it's been? Okay. What's next? Lung function. So how are we going to measure that? That's the ratio. You're going to use a peak expiratory flow rate. Or if you've got a portable spirometer, you can do it, but you can do it with peak expiratory flow. Because it's a good, it gives you some indication of what their FEV1 is. Okay. So she showed you charts that you can plot. So for kids, it's going to, I think for kids it's height and age. Adults, it is sex and um, age, I believe. So you can go on the chart and you can find out what is the goal. Where do you want? Where do you want? What percent of their of their peak expiratory flow do you want? Above 80. 80. 80. 80 and above is normal. Where is? Where do we start to worry? Between what? 70, 79. What's under that? What happens? We're really worried then. It's 50 percent. Right? What else? What's after lung function? You can use those. Uh, I do some. Uh, exacerbations, if you, have, if you don't use them. And what are you going to ask them? Have you been hospitalized? Have you taken a steroid burst? Have you gone to the ER? Have you gone to your doctor for extra breathing treatments? Those are important. If people are sick enough that they will seek care, it tells you those airways are not well controlled. Okay. Um, let's see. The other thing with activities is age appropriate, like the things I told, told you with kids, but also asking about sports, recess, that's important. Um, I found a group of, of um, an age group, teenage boys do not like to use steroids. They think it weakens their muscle. So one of my biggest bargaining chips with guys, boys, was I want to play sports. Most of them are coming because they can't run anymore on the soccer field. They can't keep up, they can't stay in, they're spending too much time on the bench. So those were always my big 
that's I could bargain. I could always get a, a boy to do what I wanted if I could get him into sports. So working with them in terms of understanding what the steroid does, getting them under good control, and knowing how to do uh, pre-exercise treatments. So what do we use for exercise-induced asthma? It's very common. What are we going to do? So we're going to pre-treat. We can use albuterol. We can use some of the other drugs. We're going to pre-treat them 15 minutes before they're going to do some type of activity that they know causes them to get short of breath. Okay. So these do not count in their albuterol use. So let's, if they come in and go, I pre-treat before every the time I get out for basketball practice. Okay. Great. <coughs> and how long can you go? So I look at how long could you go before we did that and how long can you go now? They still may not be able to get through the whole exercise or the whole workout without getting short of breath, but what you tell them is then you take another you treat again. Most of the time they'll be able to get through 30 minutes to an hour. They'll usually be able to get through an hour at least. But I ask a lot about recess and I ask a lot about gym. If you're in gym, what can you do? I also figured they figure out that if I tell them my asthma is not very good today, I don't have to run laps in the gym. <laughs> so I'm also always working with that as well because they learn pretty quickly to manipulate things they don't want with their, with their disease. That's just normal. Okay, you got it? So these are the things that you're going to ask every time they come in to figure out what your control like. Okay? And you've got very concrete goals of working. It does not take very long to do this. What I would do is I had it already typed up. I'd give it to them. We'd do it on check-in. While they're waiting for me to come get them, they can fill it out so that I can look at it. Okay. Yes. So if the patient comes in and say they're using their inhaler like more than two times a week, but then they're not having nighttime symptoms like as often, like do you go by like, what is most? Like the would you say it's more moderate or I look at all things. If they're still using their albuterol a lot and everything else looks normal, I'd look at technique. I'd also look at what time of the season of the year it is. Um, so kids that I know that have exacerbations during a season, I always start them ahead. Two or three weeks ahead of the season, we start treating their, you know, are they having symptoms of allergic rhinitis? Are they having allergies that are exacerbate, exacerbating? If you've got folks with allergic rhinitis that is not treated, you cannot get their asthma under good, good control. If you don't treat allergies, you can't get it under good control. So then it's time that where you, if I get a real allergic kid, I always send them on for testing. They have all kinds of criteria about what age they will test, but it's, it's well worth it to start figuring that out. Okay, I feel like I'm losing you guys. Are you just work tired? Okay. I just think this is so exciting. I'm not talking. Okay, chromaline. Any other questions about that? Uh, yes. Yes. Is there a, any symptom that would override another? So, like, say you have less than one nighttime awakening, so that would put you in well control, but then you have. Uh, I'll tell you what would override for me would be lots of albuterol and a peak expiratory flow rate that is, is not at goal. Those are the main two. Absolutely. Peak expiratory flow rate will always start going down and will perceive an exacerbation by about three days. So if, you can, if people are really unstable, if I can get them to do peak flows, and she talked to you about action plans, right? Yes. She showed you the green, yellow, red. Yes. If you fill those out and you practice and you drive it home and you support it, then patients can either quickly uh, figure out when they're in trouble and get help earlier, uh, or you'll, and you'll have a better idea of what's going on at home. It's hard to get people to do peak flows. They just, I don't know why, it's not hard to do it. Okay, that's what would override for me. Chromalin uh, sodium, page 18. We've talked about this before, remember, with eyes, with the allergic conjunctivitis. Okay, so mast cell stabilizers are the, I think they're the only drug that can't, will do late and, and early. So to get the early uh, allergic phase and the late. 
to get the late, you have to they have to be on the drug for about four to six weeks. But they do have some uh, bronco relaxation, bronco dilating effects uh, that can be used in acute. You'll find for the most part it's a second line drug, okay? not quite as as potent as the inhaled steroids. Can be used as an alternative in children, pregnant women who don't want to use an inhaled corticosteroid. This would be a second. It'll work for your milder people. It is not going to work for the, the more moderate to severe. It won't work in the moderate to severe as well. You'll have to have something else. But in, the, in those lower ones, these will work. You can also use crumlin as a pretreatment, uh, but you, you're going to have to work with the folks to, to know how to, to do that. But they, they could use it as a pretreat. Biggest thing is cough. It is a very well tolerated drug. The only thing is it has to be given more frequently. That's its big downside. Okay, Montelukast. Are you not hearing things that are different from what you heard on on uh, Friday? Is this all repeat for you? Okay. Okay. Mechanism of action. So there's lots of leukotriene. Um, Inhibitors and antagonists, pretty much what people use now for asthma is Montelukast. So if you look up there, you'll see that the cyst these uh, cyst 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 oh, good. <laughs> <Leukotrides. laughs> these, the LTC4, the LTD5, LTE, these are the old long-acting uh, uh, substances of anaphylaxis. That's what we used to call it before they were tight. Uh, so these are usually late phase uh, products. So Montelukast keeps, uh, is a receptor antagonist and it sits on the receptor and doesn't allow those to work. Those are very powerful. You don't find this drug to be quite as powerful. It's usually an add-on. It's never a, a replacement for a steroid, uh, but it is also good, sometimes good adjunct treatment for uh, patients with allergic components. So, well, I don't think it works in everybody. To me, it's a it's a weak sister. But some uh, folks get um, get additive effects. So you see the the problem with those leukotrienes is that eosinophil recruitment. That's why they're late phase bronchoconstriction, mucus secretion, and plasma oxidation. Okay. So that's what that's what monoprocast is actually. So again, you usually, if you look at the steps, it's usually second-line therapy. Remember we talked about uh, don't prescribe it to people who have active pre-existing uh, depression or psychiatric disorder because it increases the, the rate. So talking to, talking to parents or to the people who live in the house with the person about that and catching that early on is important. Next page, the, the one thing that's good about Monolucast is that it's uh, very adaptable for children. They have granules for the young ones that you can uh, mix with food. Uh, you have a chewable tablet for the young kids. Older kids have a tablet, chew tablet as well. And then adults um, have a tablet that's swallowed. It's once a day, it's night. It's, just, it's one of the more unusual drugs that we give at night instead of in the day. Okay. Questions about those? So the the next drugs are are the biologics, and those are the ones that are going to either impact eosinophils or IgE. So in terms of eosinic as eosinic and eosinophilic, really, um, <laughs> See my coffee's wearing off. <laughs> asthma. So this is beginning to be recognized as an important uh, subtype. Again, these are the folks that are not going to respond to usual measure. Uh, they usually are more severe. Uh, and severe asthma is very difficult to control um, with the drugs that we've had to date. Have to be so uh, history of allergic um, allergies in the family or in the person themselves. Late onset. So you see this more in adults. In children, you see more of the allergic asthma. 
So people are diagnosed in their, um, say, in their late teens, early 20s, or even when you get past 35, it becomes more difficult to discern asthma from uh, COPD. So eosinophils, you'll remember, come from the bone marrow. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a, a stem cell that they all come from, and you have two lines that diverge. Uh, the myeloid progenitor cells give rise to the eosinophils. Uh, there's lots of, just, uh, just from a time standpoint, there's uh, in the text, I've talked about the, the role of interleukin-5 and how it helps in the differentiation and the activation of eosinophils. That's why it's one of the targets, uh, pharmacologic targets for um, patients with this type of asthma. If you look at the next page, it kind of gives you a schema and an uh, explanation of the, all the factors that affect and are playing a role. So eosinophils take direction from lots of different other cells. These are the uh, T helper cells type 2. They are the ones that produce this interleukin-5. And interleukin-5 does a lot of, in terms of transforming eosinophils into more active cells. They also, that interleukin-5 has impact, I don't think they put the bone marrow out there. Interleukin-2 also directs the bone marrow to put out more eosinophils. Uh, so it kind of multiplies the, um, the effects. You can also see that eosinophils do a lot of talking with other cells, macrophages, uh, basophils, mast cells, uh, in terms of activating them and getting them ready. So the, the immune system is very interconnected. Uh, so a lot of these, in every place you see a, a bullseye, that is a, a targeted place for, for drugs to work. Some of, our, some of them are under investigation like those IL-5s and IL-33s, are, there's drugs being developed uh, for them, and IL-13 as well. Uh, so if we can modify that, then we can modify the effects of those eosinophils uh, on asthma. Eosinophils tend to be tissue-dwelling cells. They are everywhere in the body. Uh, and so they, they are part of the lining of your airway. And so once they're activated, they're right there and they can exert an effect. We still can recruit them, but we have a lot of them already there, just like with the mast cells that are ready to uh, do the work that they've been created to do. So on the next page, 23, Zolar. Zolar's been out now for oh, probably a decade at least. It is a monoclonal antibody. And I brought a little... Let me show you this. I'm not going to test you on this, but just to kind of review. So monoclonal antibodies are, we talked a little about, about this when we were looking at the, the uh, vaccines. So we're going to a vaccin a vaccinate or immunize a mouse, and we're going to get it to produce uh, the antibodies that we want. The good thing with monoclonal is they all look the same. It is a population that's homogeneous. The problem is, is that the host cell, the mouse, then starts to play a role in what it looks like. So if you look at this, so the, 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 the murine monoclonal antibodies were the first. They've been around a long time. They are all mouse. So you'll see over here, high potential for immunogenic, immunogenic effect. So uh, the problem is, is that when you, they're, they're effective, but they will also evoke an immune response. And that immune response can neutralize your drug. So while they are still produced, they are, they're a problem. So we moved to what was considered a chimeric antibody. So it had about a third of its makeup was mouse, less immunogenic, still effective as, a, as an agent. But it looked about 65% of it looked like a, oh, you can't see this. Murine, highest potential. Here's the chimeric, so 65% human, not as quite of a, a big immune response. Then we move to the humanized. So a lot of what we talked about with our last, oh, I can't remember now what we were 
looking at, a lot of those were humanized. Okay. Now we have what we call fully human. Uh, so they'll use that word when they're describing the, the monoclonal antibody. They'll use either murine, chimeric, humanized, or fully humanized. Most of the ones we have on the market now are in this range. The other thing that's good is that the names indicate and will tell you. If they don't list it, the name will tell you. Okay. So Zumab means it's a fully humanized. I'm sorry, humanized. So it's 90% human. The UMAP, not as many of those around, but they're, they're fully human. You'll see a lot of these, the XIMAV, those are chimeric, and then the OMAP mean murine. So the, the name will tell you. And they're listed there at the top. So just to kind of give you an orientation to those. Okay. So let's look at Zolar. Zolar is against IgE. It's not against the eosinophil. So the IgE, where does it come into play in an allergic reaction? What does it do? Rapid onset, okay. It's always it's always part of allergic, parasitic reactions, but what did, where does it fit? What does it do? It's an activator. Activates what? This means mast cells. Okay. So they will interfere with the ability of IgE to sit on those mast cells, and mast cells do what? They release all those. I mean, we we say histamine, but there's tons of, of uh, cytokines that come out of that. So that is what Zolar does. Binds those IgEs on the mast cells and will not allow them to uh, to do their work. Pathophys, I've given you this part as just background. I'm not going to test you on those, uh, but you, I would advise you just to read through it. In terms of, at the bottom, Zolar therapy and asthma, so patients who would be candidates are six years and older, moderate to persistent, uh, sorry, moderate to severe. Asthma symptoms that are not inadequately controlled with inhaled corticosteroids. IgE levels between 30 and 700. Did he talk about the difficulties in using like eosinophils or IgEs as a predictable uh, oh, um, indicators for therapy? I saw it in his, in his slides. I didn't know how much he emphasized it. So using a peripheral smear for eosinophils um, or for IgE is still not perfect. It can be part of what you, the information you get but they've got other, um, I think I put those down there. So we'll see them when we get over to the other two. So IgE between 30 and 700 uh, in allergic sensitization based on skin testing. So again, I don't think you'll, if you're just in a, a, a random, not, not a random, but if you're in a primary care, family medicine, internal medicine, rare that you would use these, but you ought to at least know there's other things you can do. I, these folks need probably an um, allergist uh, or a pulmonologist who specializes in <coughs> working with them. Okay, if you look over on page 25, just to let you know how it's done, uh, it is an injectable, it's given subcutaneously, based on body weight, given every two to four weeks. Um, okay, let me, I'm going to keep moving. I want you both to be aware of these. I'm not going to do a lot of testing on it, but I want you to be aware of it. So the anti-leukin, uh, interleukin-5, these are the newest of the agents. There's two of them. There's um, uh, Nucala and the other one is, uh, what is it? Oh, let's see. <laughs> So these are going to tie up these two, tie up interleukin-5. The other one, the last one, is a, it sits on the receptor and doesn't allow interleukin-5 uh, to sit on the receptor and evoke a response. So even though these are all uh, anti-interleukin, uh, two of them, uh, they have a little bit different mechanism. 
So these are going to affect the eosinophil, not the IgE. And what they do is they, they decrease recruitment from the bone marrow, and they decrease the ability of uh, eosinophils to be activated. So in the, 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 um, the outcome there you're looking for when you use these is decrease in the amount of exacerbations. Look over on the very last page 28, indication for them with maintenance treatment. So again, so it won't be used in, um, in an acute for 12 and older, reduced exacerbation, improved quality of life. So improved quality of life would be being able to do the activities you want to be able to do. Sleeping through the night, being able to be active, as active as you want to, being able to work. Staying out of the hospital, those would be improved quality of life. The problem with these drugs is that they are very low incidence, but they can cause um, hypersensitivity reactions, severe ones. So they're going to need to be administered in areas that are able and capable of running a code. So these are going to be injectables. They're going to go into the into a clinic and get them in, uh, get in uh, their injection. Yes. With that sort of reaction, is it something that they only have to go in at first and they know you're, they're not going to react? Uh, I, don't, like for I don't think so. I think it's, as far as I know, it's forever. That's, that's my understanding. The last one, uh, the Cinera, the, this is the receptor <coughs> antagonist. And this one, again, is for 12 and older. It's an injectable also, also can cause hypersensitivity reaction. Its clinical effects are the same in terms of reduced exacerbations, but it also has glucocorticoid sparing effect. So often when you get to severe asthma, one of the problems is you have to put them on oral steroids. So while it, help, it controls them, it puts them at risk for all the, the bad side effects of um, steroids that are not reversible. So cataracts, osteoporosis, muscle weakening, um, thinning skin, increased bruising. None of that can be reversed. So that is a real problem in having to use and psychiatric symptoms that can go along with long-term uh, steroids. So if you can, so whenever you see a drug that has that ability, that is a good thing. If we can cut down the amount of steroid they need to take orally, that's great. We're not looking at cutting down the amount that they can use on an inhaled basis. So very broad with these. I gave you a lot of information just to give you context, but you want to know what they, which one they are, what their main target is, and their, their main outcome. and mechanism of action. Those would be the big things that I want you to know. I think you ought to be aware so that you can move, send people on. Again, you're not going to see these in regular practice for a while. Okay. Questions. It's a lot of material. Mm -hmm. Okay, reminder, we, uh, the test is at 3 today, right? Mm -hmm. So as soon, when he gets done, if you will um, exit the room, let me get it um, set up like I'd like to do it for the test. So if you'll give me 15 minutes or so, i get the test laid out. So probably just plan a break for 15 minutes. So that way I can get your stuff out. Uh, and then we'll go as soon as, as uh, he's done. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. <laughs> 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 It's the name of the game today. Yeah.